This year marks the 350th anniversary of the first publication of The Complete Angler by Isaac Walton. In the first of a new series, the philosopher, the fish and the dove, passionate fly fisherman Geoffrey Palmer celebrates the life and work of Walton, the fish which inspired him, and the river dove where he spent so much time. The river dove has its birth up on the Moreland Hills just outside of Buxton and it runs down over what is basically open moorland. It then flows south towards Hartington, then goes through a limestone gorge, Beresford Dale, Wolfscote Dale, Milldale into Dovedale. At the end of Dovedale the River Manifold joins it. It then flows towards Ashbourne and from Ashbourne towards Utoxeter and Utoxeter down towards Burton-on-Trent where it joins the River Trent. Whilst I'm here and I'm fishing in Dovedale, not just Dovedale, in many similar places, I'm very, very conscious and aware of Isaac Walton being there, looking over my shoulder, and I hope he approves of what I'm doing. Unfortunately, I only came to fishing rather late in life, which is one of my few real regrets. But now it has become so fascinating and all-absorbing to me that um, the rest of my life has to be arranged around it. And for many people like me, the book, The Complete Angler, is held in the highest possible regard. And I understand completely the respect which anglers like Tony Bridget feel for Isaac Walton. Nearly 400 years since his birth, the author of The Complete Angler is still revered as the father of fishing. And perhaps nowhere is his presence more keenly felt than in the Peak District, the way he spent so many hours fishing, often alongside his friend Charles Cotton, in the cold, clear waters of the River Dove. We're at a spot, just at the moment, which is called Lover's Leap. I've just heard a plot of a trout just in the back eddy from where we are now. Just in front, as I've been talking, I've been noticing a family of dippers that have got its nest up in the top of a little cave in front of us, and that's been a traditional nesting place for those dippers for the 35 or 40 years that I've been associated with the river, and probably their ancestors have had their home there long before that. But also we've got this sparkling water that runs across in front of us, and we shall catch some fish today, I'm certain of that. I think that angling is absolutely beautiful. I think that fly casting, for example, is a glorious physical art. Oh, sir, doubt not but that angling is an art. Is it not an art to deceive a trout with an artificial fly? A trout that is more sharp-sighted than any hawk? and more watchful and more timorous than your high-metal marlin is bold. <laughs> and yet I doubt not to catch a brace or two tomorrow for a friend's breakfast. Doubt not, therefore, sir, but that angling is an art, and an art worth your learning. The question is rather whether you are capable of learning it. It is quite magical in a way. The rod becomes an extension of your arm, there is a marvellous harmony between you and your tackle and the river, and it's quite spellbinding. For angling is somewhat like poetry. Men are born to be so. I mean, with inclinations to it, though both may be heightened by discourse and practice, but he that hopes to be a good angler must not only bring an inquiring, searching, observing wit, but he must bring a large measure of hope and patience and a love and a propensity to the art itself. But having once got and practised it, then doubt not but angling will prove to be so pleasant that it will prove to be like virtue, a reward to itself. It's a huge desire to become as close to the spirit of the river as you can possibly be. And it's hugely seductive. It's just a glorious, glorious feeling on a beautiful river when you know you're doing it right and you're just at one with everything around you. It's just glorious. Hello, welcome to the Isaac Walton Cottage. Do come in. The cottage.
cottage is situated in a small hamlet called Shallowford, close to the River Meese, where Isaac Walton fished. Isaac was born in Stafford in September 1593. His father, Jervis, was a tippler, which in those days was a trade, somewhere between an ordinary innkeeper and an alehouse keeper. We think Isaac remained in Stafford for his school days, but by 1610 he's in London as an apprentice to his wealthy brother-in-law. And in 1624 he certainly got his own premises in London. The big question here is, what did he do for a living? We're always asked. Some people think he was an ironmonger. He was certainly a member of the Ironmongers Liveried Company, but we think that might have been more of a social recognition sort of standing. My honest scholar, it is now past five of the clock. We will fish till nine and then go to breakfast. Go to yonder sycamore tree and hide your bottle of drink under the hollow of it. For about that time, and in that place, we will make a brave breakfast with a piece of powdered beef. Isaac was a staunch royalist, a staunch Anglican, Church of England neither of which were very much in favour as the Civil War rolled on. So he gave up his premises in London and moved out to rural Clerkenwell. But during the war and after, certainly during Cromwell's time, he spent more and more time riding up and down to Staffordshire. And in 1655 he bought this farm, just two years after the first edition of The Complete Angler. I mean, Isaac for me now is, in many ways, it's comfort reading. If I'm in a strange country, I will take with me frequently either Winnie the Pooh or Wind in the Willows or The Complete Angler. And, and it doesn't matter which of the three, and of course there's a great difference between the three, but they have that same effect on me. And that's somehow giving me a world that I'd really want to get into and really want to explore and really want to be a part of. He had this ability to describe angling and he had the ability to describe the world in which angling takes place. And that's a huge, huge talent and he had it. You're with him as he walks around the water meadows besides the silvery streams and you visit the alehouses with him. You sleep between sheets scented with lavender. You drink your barley wine and play shovelboard and meet the milkmaids and sing and rejoice. So it is a lovely description of the countryside in those times. Now, if Isaac Walton was here in the early days, the first edition of the book, I'm afraid he'd plonk in a great big lobworm in here, or even um, a big black slug. Now he says that uh, black slugs are very, very attractive to fish, uh, particularly to chub. But to make them more attractive, he'd cut the belly open with a knife to show the white of the inside so they'd be more attractive. Well, I, I don't think you'll find any anglers going along uh, those lines at the present time. But um, in fly fishing, what we're trying to do is to imitate an insect that the fish is going to take or a fly that the fish is likely to see or is likely to be about and so the trout will have seen that at this time of year. This is the best time for fly fishing. May going through into June are the time when we get most of the ephemera, a lot of the sedge flies, um, they are hatching about this time. But also mayfly, it was noted years and years ago that um, mayfly hatches on the southern chalk streams, the test and the etching, were so great that they would stop the traffic on the road. So great were the spinners that were falling on the road. And I also know that uh, many a parish priest in Ireland has been told of the hatch of mayfly starting as cut short his sermon to go out and fish. I'm sure he fished as a little boy in Stafford, pulling tiddlers out of the River Sow. But in the early 1660s, he actually writes a letter to his publisher and he mentions that he's been an angler for the past 30 years. So we think he picked it up certainly in middle age. He became a gentleman angler. It was a pastime. And according to Charles Cotton, Isaac was one of the best coarse fishermen in the land. He not only wrote a very good book about angling, he was a very good angler to begin with. So, having talked about the fishing, I'm going to do some. 
So uh, just moving into the water and moving, moving forward, being careful the stones here, but just trying a cast. And so there we are, I've plopped, I've plopped the little fly and it's just coming alongside and the pool just running down with with the current the movement in, in casting is trying to extend the line and I do this by using the rod as a form of whip but perhaps not as severe as uh, you would use on a whip action but that's it it's it's a forward cast and then a backward cast and what we're actually doing is using the spring of the rod to cast the line Isaac fished very, very simply with just one length of tree branch. For line, they would use horsehair, either tied to the end of the rod or there'd be a ring at the end of the rod and just the line would be threaded through and held by hand. In the complete angle, he does mention reels. They're coming into use in England by then. But he says, some people use a winch, implying he never did. He fished very simply, but he still caught all those fish. The trout is usually caught with a worm, or a minnow, which some call a pink, or with a fly, either a natural or an artificial fly. You are to know that there are so many sorts of flies as the be of fruit. I will name you but some of them, as the dun fly, the stone fly, the red fly, the moor fly, the tawny fly. I mean, look down there just below the little branch that's in the river, and there's a, there's a fish come up there twice, very quickly in succession. So... Uh, it seems as though things are getting better. And dear listener, we should catch some fish. Look, you scholar, you see? I have hold of a good fish. <laughs> and now I see it as a trout. I pray, put that net under him, and touch not my line. For if you do, then we break all. <laughs> well done, scholar. I thank you. I'll extend that a bit trying to keep my balance and there we are success at last and now we've got a, a fish on um, a nice fish by the look of it it's a brown trout and so bringing it in towards the the net I have another bite come scholar lay down your rod and help me to land this as you did the other so now we shall be sure to have a good dish of fish for supper. And then we can just bring the fish to the bank side. That's a lovely wild trout. You can see that the deep olive colour that this particular one is. We can see those beautiful white spots with vermilion centres. And then the black and deep red spots on the back. And then turning over we can see uh, the olive colour going right through the back. And there, near to the tail, is the little adipose fin. So I'm just going to take the fly from the fish's mouth and return the fish to the, the water. Oops. Joining me, Geoffrey Palmer, on the banks of the River Dove were anglers Tony Bridget and John Bailey, Gillian Bold and Bruce Braithwaite were from the Isaac Walton Cottage, and Gary Seister is the Fisheries Technical Officer for the Upper Trent Region of the Environment Agency. The readings were taken from The Complete Angler by Isaac Walton. The Philosopher, the Fish and the Dove was produced in Bristol by Sarah Blunt. Next week at the same time, Geoffrey presents an Angler's Guide to Barbel.